Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to be installing this brand new Mitchell Overdrive into my 1931 Model A Coupe. Before we dive too much into this, I just wanted to show how unbelievably well Mitchell packages these things. They put little wooden plates on each side of the torque tube, keep it from blowing through the box. They have two by four pieces holding everything in place. There's little notches cut into the two by fours to make sure nothing moves around in the box. Unbelievably well packaged. I mean, if they put that much concern just into getting these things to you, it just gives you a good idea of how well their product itself probably is. If they're willing to pay that much attention just to shipping. Included in the box, you'll find your shipping checklist where somebody manually goes through, checks every single item before signing off on it. Inside, you find your installation instructions, your invoice, business card if you ever need to get a hold of them. The gasket for the torque tube. I did also get their rear axle pinion puller and reinstall kit, which includes its own set of instructions. Comes individually packaged for each item, as you can see. Again, very well done, neatly organized. We'll close that back up for now. So now I've got the overdrive unit free from the rest of its packaging, and again, they just do an incredibly good job with this. As you can see, they literally screw the cardboard straight to these 2x4s, so that way everything stays very stationary. I kind of killed the box while opening it up, but again, bravo to Mitchell for just how well packaged these things are. So before I take this and put it under there, if you've not yet seen Paul Shin's video, he also has a video out where he installs one of these in a coupe much similar to mine. I highly recommend you follow the link in the description and check that out. If you have seen his video, you might be wondering, well, why am I making another one? If you've seen my previous video, you know what this is. This is a Burt's block and has a counterweighted crankshaft on it with five main bearings, which means I can sit and do 55, 60 all day long and don't have to worry about it. In fact, it's very, very, very smooth. So not only do I have the Burt's block here, but in just a second, when I take the floor out, you're going to see that I have a V8 transmission out of an early 30s flathead in here. I believe it's a 38 in this one. I do have a 39 over here in my pile that I'll be rebuilding shortly. But if you're not familiar with those flathead transmissions, they are synchronized for second and third gear. But what's even better is second gear is actually usable. Um, if you've seen Paul's video, you'll see where he talks about how the gears are something like this with first second third being way over there that's no longer the case with the flat eye transmission it brings them all nice so they're nice and even what that means is when you shift into third gear from second gear it no longer bogs you can actually wind second gear out quite a bit so with those two things in mind the question is is this going to be worth it and the long story is, is i ordered this in january i ordered this in august this was originally supposed to be tied up to my original engine over here, which unfortunately gave up the ghost. The center Babbitt decided to go on vacation. It has not been seen since. So rather than canceling this order, now that I've had this Burtz and I've put nearly 3,000 miles on this guy at any number of different speeds, it's been fantastic. I knew this was coming. Um, Mitchell had finally called me up about a month back said hey we've got it ready it's ready to be shipped out to you i'm like all right i don't know if i'll need it anymore i don't know if i'll use it that much usually if i'm cruising around with the club we're doing 35 40 everywhere which is absolutely nothing in this thing and having that v8 second gear makes it where i can basically handle any kind of hill or any kind of speed without really ever bogging so the question that we're going to answer at the end of this video hopefully through some test drives, is, is this thing still worth it, despite everything I've gotten here already? So typically when I do these, I like to start in the top of the car and work my way down. That way when you're working inside of here and pulling the floor out and we're taking the bolts out of the clamshell there, that you're not worrying about the car being supported on jack stands, or in my case, I'll be having it on the bumper jack that's sitting back there. But uh, it just makes it a lot more safe. So I'm gonna cut right here while I pull this out since I'm assuming everyone's pulled the floor out before. Okay, now with the floor removed, you can actually see my flathead transmission. I've gotten this. This is, I believe, a 38. 
which has some of the earlier type synchronizers. I do have a 39, I'll be swapping them a bit later, but we're gonna begin by removing the clamshell bolts here. We're gonna get this clamshell out to remove the two from the top, two from the bottom, and then on these, there's also two more on either side, which I'll remove from the bottom. If you're a fan of Stranger Things, welcome to the Upside Down. We're gonna continue by removing these two bottom bolts from the clamshell. I do have the side ones removed and the top piece of the clam removed already. Then next, we're gonna get the speedometer gear while we're here. That'll take care of the clamshell and the torque tube itself. So here you can see I've got the clamshell fully removed. I do have the speedometer cable just kind of dangling there free out of the way. Next, we'll be coming back here, removing these two clevis pins. One's for the emergency brake, one's for the brake. Then we'll have to go to the other side as well and remove that sides. Now that we have all of our brake rods free, we're gonna move to the back of the car. We're gonna remove these nuts off of these U-bolts and that'll allow our leaf spring to drop free once we lift up the back of the car. Now we have those nuts and those retainers out of the way, the rear leaf spring can drop free from its pocket. So next we'll have to come and we'll have to take our rear shock linkages off. Or you can either take the dog leg off or you can take the arm off the shock, whichever is easier if you have them. For me, it's probably gonna be easier to take these dog legs apart because I do have the later versions. So I'm gonna zip those off right quick and then we should be done underneath the car. Now that we have the shock links removed from both sides, we can move outside the car. So next up, I'm gonna come along, I'm gonna break the lug nuts free on each side while we still have the weight on the car. So next I'm gonna be using my very large bumper jack to lift the rear of the car up. This will free the body from the leaf spring. And it'll free this rear axle up. I'm then I'm gonna come back to each side, jack it up with my small little jack, just the axle itself, pull the wheels off and set them on the ground. The reason I'm using my bumper jack is because it has built-in stops. I'm using this little lever here along the way so I can kind of rest it down on those stops. And then I'm gonna come back and put jack stands underneath the body as well once I have the axle rolled out. So here you can see I've got the body jacked up quite a bit. I don't have the leaf spring quite free just yet. Um, what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna get my floor jack, come along to each one of the wheels, jack it up ever so slightly, then pull the wheel off and then set it back on the floor. That way I'll be able to slide everything out. Okay, now with the wheel is removed, hopefully it makes a bit more sense what I'm doing here. I have these Harbor Freight wheel dollies and the drums just barely fit in them where it does slide pretty easily. As you can sort of see. <laughs> uh, do be careful when you're doing this to kind of balance the height. You don't want to get it too contorted where you're bending up your breaker rods here. So with that set up like this on both sides on the rollers, what I'm going to do next is come back underneath the car and we're going to take the snout of the torque tube out of the, uh, the brake cross member and we're going to set that down on a dolly of its own. So back under the car, this is where you eventually want to end up. I have the front of the torque tube resting on a little moving dolly. I have the rear resting on my little Harbor Freight dollies. Everything can slide. I did take off the longer brake rods as um, unfortunately I didn't have my taller jack stands. So I'm gonna have to use the bumper jack the entire time and take the entire axle out through the side of the car instead of through the back. And here we have it, the axle is finally removed. Again, it's on the slider so it rolls around pretty easy. I'm um, probably just gonna back it up and stand it up against the door over there. So I can start working on taking off the front torque tube here. So now that we have it stood up, the next thing we want to do is take this bolt and nut off here. And then after that, we're going to be digging around in the goop up there to pull off the retainer that holds the uh, speedometer gear in place. And then after that, we can start by removing our torque tube. All right, with that lower bolt removed next, we want to come up top into the goop. Hopefully the camera will pick it up, but down inside there, you can just barely make it out, but there's a spring clip that we need to pull off. So here's just a slightly better view of that clip that I was talking about I've now got it pulled up and out of its spot ready to pull off but I figured I'd give you a good idea of what I'm talking about I was able to get it with just a couple of um, Harbor Freight picks just got it wrapped around it and just pulled it straight up all right I've got all the torque tube bolts removed at the bottom there so now if you made it this far the torque tube should be free as you can see it spins nice and easily next I'm going to lift this thing sort of straight up. Unfortunately, I don't have very tall ceilings. 
You have to angle it a bit, but I'll be pulling this off next. All right, now that we got the torque tube out of the way, next we're gonna rotate the drive shaft around. There's a metal retainer on the bottom of this top nut that gets folded down and holds it in place. So we just need to find where that tab is bent up over the top nut, and then we're gonna take a screwdriver and knock it free. So now with the tab bent out of the way, I'm gonna use these very cheap, large mouth, but thin, adjustable wrenches that I got off Amazon quite a while ago. I think they were like nine bucks each. But um, I believe these are two and one eighth inch. I don't have a wrench that size, let alone two of them at the moment. So I've had these for a while. These generally shouldn't be too terribly tight, so this should work. So like I said, I'm gonna take this top nut off. Be careful that I don't do anything with the bottom nut just yet. Got hung up ever so slightly there on the tab. I didn't bend it down the greatest. But it's coming out all right. Okay, so we'll get that one out of there. Also get this tab worked free and take that out at the same time. Which it should just pop up. Everything's a bit gooey down here and sticky. Okay, take those up and over the top. So yeah, before you take this bottom nut off here, you do want to index it right at this front keyway here. I put a tiny little spot in there, which I'm not sure if it'll show up on the camera or not, but that way when you tighten this nut back up later, you can get it exactly in the same spot, theoretically to the same tightness. So next you want to install this pinion protection flange that comes with the Mitchell kit. As you can see, it has two little slots on either end. And what you'll do is you'll install two little Allen plugs on either side of the flange. Then you set this down on top of there and it protects your flange from getting damaged when you put the pusher on there. Typically I like to put these plugs just below flush on either side. It um, avoids, if you use the pusher without this, of it gouging into the flange or potentially lining it up with one of the bolt holes and then messing up your threads. So you always want to have this down first. Then next I'll get the pusher set up or the puller, I'm sorry, set up and drop down. All right, we're back now. Unfortunately, I did have an issue with my puller. Uh, for some reason, the the threads drilled through here just were not right. There was something wrong with them. I couldn't get the uh, puller bolts to work right. So I'm gonna improvise here because I just don't have the time to wait. So I'm actually using the installer nuts turned backwards with the nuts underneath. And I'm gonna try to see if I can just kind of manually crank these with the allen keys on the top while holding the nut underneath and see if I can lift it out that way. Hopefully this one's not in there too stubbornly so I don't damage anything. I believe it's a 9 16 on the bottom. So we'll just slowly kind of come along put a little tension on each side. Slowly start trying to lift this thing out of here evenly. I do not recommend you do it this way. Like I said, I just don't have the time at the moment to wait. I don't have a tap of the right size or whatever thread size this is to fix it. Okay, so now we've got a bit of tension on there. So now we'll start coming back and probably do about a half turn in each one. and just rotate around. Okay, so after a bit of work, this is where you should end up. It ended up pulling out just fine using the 
other pulling method style, which again, I don't recommend doing that way. As you can see, it did leave a little bit of gouging in my pinion surface here. I'm gonna have to kind of go back and smooth that out. Okay, now I've got it just clamped in place here. So next we're gonna be removing this nut. It does have a cotter pin in it, which when you do reinstall this, do make sure it is not bent over the top of the end. You want them bent down around the side. Otherwise, if you install it with that way, it does interfere and you will have issues. With just a little bit of convincing from my friend right here, I was able to get this nut loose. I have it backed off where it's just past the end of the threads here. That leaves a little bit of gap between it and the gear. So what we're going to do next is basically flip this whole assembly upside down. And then we're going to put this back on there just to kind of protect the threads. We're going to use the torque tube laying on the floor over there. And essentially use that as a big old giant slide hammer to bash this whole assembly off the end of here. Included with your kit, you'll find these two thread protectors. One's marked MA for Model A, one's marked MM for Mitchell Manufacturing. The Model A one slides right over the diameter of the original drive shaft. And this will slide down and sit above the threads that we took those giant nuts off of earlier and protect them while we try to knock the bottom end loose from this. So if we drop that down, it's a pretty tight fit, <laughs> knocking up all the goop and everything else along the way. I'm gonna have to probably clean that bearing out after all of this. Yuck, that's gross. And you wanna slide that down if you can. There we go. All the way to the bottom, like so. Okay, so now what you want to do is take this full assembly with the torque tube installed over it, find a piece of wood. I just used a piece that came with the kit. Put your uh, end of the pinion gear where that nut was on the wood so it protects it from getting damaged. And essentially what you want to do is basically use your torque tube as a slide hammer. You just want to kind of get it centered on there then pick it up and hammer it down. After a few good whacks, uh, if you look on the bottom there, hopefully the gear will be knocked down and it'll be sitting against that nut that you loosened up earlier. And then the whole assembly will just come right off. Now you can see everything is nice and free. Oh, it's all kind of slid here. I just got it upside down so you can actually see it. Um, if I take this nut off. Essentially everything should slide out of here. So I'm going to take all these bearings and clean them up, repack it, check and make sure they're all good. So far, just looking over them, they seem to be pretty good. But I'll check the races as well while I'm in here. Yeah, you can see some of the debris that fell down from earlier. Some, some of that hardened grease that had made its way up the shaft. But uh, we'll get all that cleaned up. So now I have the Mitchell shaft mounted in my vise. It did come with the new key already pre-installed so I didn't have to knock it out of the old drive shaft. I did clean up the bearing, checked it all while I was in there. Everything is nice and smooth, there's no pitting. Uh, once it's pre-assembled and I have a little bit of preload on here right now, everything is rotating nice and smoothly. So next up I just need to torque down this top nut here and then I'll be installing the cotter pin. And again, as a reminder, when you install it you do not want to fold it over the edge. You want to fold it down around the outside of the nut. I'll show you that once it's finished. Okay, now I have this nut torqued down and this cotter pin installed. And as you can see, I bent the ends of it downwards around the outside of the nut instead of up and over the top. So next up, I'll take this over to the axle and we'll get ready to put this pinion back in. So now we're back at the axle. I have the pinion just temporarily sitting inside. You'll need to take your pusher plate that comes with the Mitchell pinion installer kit. This one will not have the threaded holes in it. These little bolts will slide right through. These are actually going to go and install into the flange. There should be three of them. They have the allen heads on the top. I ended up using these earlier to pull with. 
because the other threads didn't quite fit. But um, in this case, they'll actually thread into the flange, and then you'll essentially go down and do the opposite of what we did earlier. Instead of uh, loosening these nuts on the bottom side and pulling up, we'll be tightening from the top and pulling down. So, so these are 9 16 so we're just going to go around to about a half turn each. Just continuously make our way around. So after a bit of effort, I finally got it fully tightened down. The bearing should be level with the flange itself. Um, I've also gone through and tightened up this bottom nut. I have it lined up with the with the punch mark that I made previously is aligned with this key. Not sure if the camera will pick that up. Now when you install the retainer, the retainer itself is also keyed, which you can just barely see there. So when you install the retainer, you should have one edge that's still bent down that you did not bend from earlier. And this will go down and line up with one of these edges of the nut. That'll also make sure that this uh, mark that you made previously is still lined up and accurate. So just make sure that you have it in the correct location. Set it down there. Everything's lining up. I can see if I rotate here that my edge is going down over the edge of the nut. So the retainer is in place, the nut itself is in place, exactly where I moved it from earlier. So next we're gonna take our, our nut from earlier, our top nut. The side's a little cleaner, so that side was down. And we'll just repeat the same. We'll face that side down as well. And we'll tighten this up. Now these nuts again don't need to be super tight if you remember when I took them off. It took very little effort to get it off. So I will tighten this down until I can no longer do it by hand. I'll get out my super cheap adjustable wrenches. And ideally we should have we should be able to get it lined up again where or to enough tightness or one of these edges will line up with the edge we folded down previously. Um, I probably should have straightened that out when I had it out earlier, but that edge is right here, so it looks like I have about a quarter of a turn to go to get it lined up. So if I go too far, if I tighten it up too much, as you can see it doesn't really line up with anything, even if I tried to go like another full turn, I wouldn't be able to get it to line up with any of the other tabs. So what we're going to do is just back it off until it lines up with the one that I removed previously. And then we'll come up, or come back with a punch. And we'll hammer this tab upwards, and that should lock this whole assembly in place. Now I have this top nut reinstalled. When you're reinstalling it, you should be able to line it up again with the tab that you bent from below earlier when you first took it off. It is possible to over tighten it ever so slightly to more um, torque than what it originally had. In that case though, most of the time you're not going to be able to get another revolution or another angle to where you're going to be able to bend up another tab. So typically if you do do that, you can just back it off until it lines up with the original one that you bent before. So I have that tab bent back up on there now. Everything's been rotating nice and smooth. The lash feels about the same as I removed it. So next up I'm going to get the gasket ready, drop it down on here. Then I'm going to go and get the coupler that'll install up here on the splines. I'll pre-grease the splines ever so slightly. So next up you want to install the coupler. Be aware that it is marked. It says this end is the sleeve is towards the overdrive unit. 
So make sure that that label is facing upwards when you install this. I did pre-grease the sleeve ever so slightly. I'm going to come back later and hit with the grease gun through the Zerk fittings. But um, just to make it easier to install, I did grease it up a bit. Next, I'm going to get the lower gasket installed. I will be hitting it with some copper spray just because my surface is a little bit marred. I did come and smooth some of that out from earlier. Now I have my lower gasket in place. And a little trick you can use if your gasket doesn't want to lay flat or if you're not using a sealant on it, you can reinstall those set screws that come from the uh, protector plate. And that'll hold your gasket in place while you set the overdrive unit down. They're pretty shallow, so they won't get in the way while you line up the splines at the top, setting everything in place. It'll just make sure that the gasket doesn't move around while you're trying to install the actual overdrive unit. So this is where you should end up next. I have the overdrive unit installed on the drive shaft, but it's not yet engaged. So as you can see, it's kind of sitting high. Where we install that coupler, we need to line up the splines with the overdrive unit and the drive shaft. This does take a bit of work. So unfortunately, I won't be able to get it on camera for you, but I like to just kind of grab the body of the unit, kind of rotate it around until I get those splines lined up. Other people will install the the studs from the puller unit and kind of use that to line up the bottom of the torque tube just to make sure that everything is nice and straight. I tend to like to do it the manual way. It seems to work a little bit easier for me. So I'm going to try to get that done. Again, I won't be able to get it on camera, but once you do, everything should line up. Then the whole unit should set down right on the gasket. So now I've got the splines lined up and the unit has sat down completely. You can see here the, the little plugs I was talking about earlier that I use as guide pins, which ended up working out perfectly. Then I was able to get the rest of the bolts started in here. I'll finish getting those installed. I'll remove the plugs, reinstall the original bolts, come through, reinstall some safety wire on this. And then we're going to come back up to the top. We'll need to reinstall our bolt up here. And then we should be good to lay this thing flat and start getting it ready to go back underneath the car. So next, while we have this out, we're going to go ahead and grease the fitting that we installed earlier. The coupler that's behind here. They give you this nice giant access port on the side. I loosened it up already, but once you take that off, you can just barely see the Zerk fitting in the center of there. Now, sometimes it won't be centered. The sleeve does move a little bit. You can kind of get in there with, um, with like a screwdriver or a pick or something and kind of center it. Just be careful that you don't mess up the threads. Otherwise, you can get like um, a different grease of fitting that might be a little easier to fit in there than the one I'm using. I have this quick fit attachment on the end of it, which is going to slide it in there. Wiggle it around a bit, get it locked in. There we go. We'll hit it with a couple of squirts. Just like that. So now I've got the overdrive unit laid flat. Now's a great time to top up the fluid. On the box, it should come empty. It should take about a quart. It does say it may take a little bit more. So I do have two just in case. Uh, I do not like to install the breather elbow at this time. As you're moving everything around, you just don't want leaking out if you need to tilt it up or anything like that. So I'll, I'll do that afterwards. Then I'm going to slide the unit under the car. Probably try to get most of the things positioned, get the torque tube installed again. I don't know that I'll record all of that. Installation is basically the opposite of removal. I should have gone fairly simple. I will try to get the camera back in once I start doing anything more with the overdrive itself, such as installing the shift linkages, the adapter kit for my Klings uh, transmission adapter, and also when I install the speedometer cable. So now you can see I have the unit installed underneath the car. Next we're gonna be installing the speedometer cable. The rear end of it with the gear, or here, goes where that little red plug is. Then there's an Allen head plug that acts as a set screw. And then we'll route the cable up along the inside of the frame rail. Here by the exhaust, up to our existing cable, where we'll screw that into the other end of our extension that comes with the kit. 
Now I have the speedometer cable installed in the unit. One thing you want to make sure of is that when you install this is that the o-ring under here is completely pressed into the housing. It can be a bit of a pain at first so um, it's a good idea to just grab the top part with a pair of pliers and twist it back and forth while you push down. You just want to make sure that it is completely seated all the way down in the housing otherwise you'll end up with an oil leak. So next you want to come to the other side of the car and on the other side of the overdrive unit there's a plug right here where we need to install the vent tube. Now they include this little brass 90 degree elbow which I'll be installing in just a second. You can install it pretty much finger tight, it does not need to be tight. It is not a drain, it is just an air vent. So here you can see I got the elbow installed with the vent tube. I just have it running up and attached to the floor temporarily. I'll attach it to that screw there just to hold it up and above the unit not out of, out of the way. That way if any fluid, like I said, does make it into the tube, it'll just kind of flow back down to the unit. Essentially you just want gases and stuff like that to be able to exit the case freely. So next we want to come up to the top of the car again and this time we're going to be installing the shift linkage bracket. Now this is designed specifically for these later flathead transmissions. It mounts on the left hand side just on top of the shift tower. Similar to how you can see the emergency brake setup is there for the cleanse adapter. However, this bracket here does not appear to be designed with the clings adapter in mind. On the left hand side you can see that the clings adapter that holds the brake rod or the brake and clutch rod in place that the pedals pivot on uses the middle bolt which I have already removed, I was test fitting earlier, and the front bolt. And this adapter, when you set it play in place, uses that same middle bolt and the back bolt. The problem is, is that there's no provision for the clings adapter to sit underneath this. It's flat. If it was thicker, you could kind of grind it down and that way it would be able to kind of sit flat and just uh, the clings adapter would sit underneath this portion. But that is not the case as it comes. So what I'm gonna do is install some washers underneath the rear bolt. And it'll lift the whole assembly up about a quarter of an inch. Now that does cause some problems with the linkage, which I'll show you later once all of this is in place. It is now interfering with the center cross member. It's hitting this front lip. My plan is to basically just go under there with a hammer, kind of bend the front of that lip up. It just hits on the front. Otherwise everything else clears. Hopefully that should fix it. And if that's the only change I need to make to make this whole situation work, I'll be pretty impressed. Otherwise, if it did sit lower, it looks like everything would clear. It doesn't look like you would hit the little ears hanging off here if you wanted to save those for some later point if you ended up going with the flathead transmit or the flathead engine. Excuse me, something of that sort. So I'm gonna get that mounted up here and then I'll show you where it's interfering. So I have the bracket installed. You can kind of see my stack of washers hiding up below. I did install two longer studs in there to just kind of give it better support. It is nice and sturdy now, it doesn't flex. So next we want to take our shift linkage, slide that in here, like so. Then we want to take our <clears throat> pivot arm and we'll just kind of start to push this together for now. We're not going to install it completely. I just want to get it hooked up so I can show you where it's hitting. And unfortunately the camera's getting in the way, but right down here where the pivot arm comes through, you can just barely make it out right in here is where it is just barely making contact. So it, it does shift just fine, even though it's hitting right there. I don't want it clanking around. So like I said, I'm going to probably go under there and just bend the front of that lip up ever so slightly. It does seem like it's angled down a bit, so it's just the very front edge of that lip that's catching. I think if I just bend it up ever so slightly, that should give me plenty of clearance. So here we are back underneath the car. 
And you can see I didn't install the shift linkage arm that goes from the pivot arm, which is buried right up in here. And then it runs back to the overdrive unit and attaches to the shift arm that just sticks out the front of the unit there. It just has a little ball joint there, which threads through and then tightens up. I don't have it completely tightened just yet. We'll get to that in a second. So while I'm under here, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna find our outlet, or where our shifter adapter, our shift lever actually goes through, which is right here, and you just barely see it. I did check the clearance to the floor. It is pretty tight. It looks like maybe about an eighth of an inch. So it's gonna be pretty close, but I wanna try to mark this spot on the floor so that way I know where to drill. I've got my little punch here and I'm gonna to try to get in there with the punch and see if I can mark it that way. It's pretty hard to do um, from this angle, especially with all this stuff here. I believe on the normal Model A transmission, this is a bit easier to do, you get a bit more access. But with the brake rod in place here, the clamshell, everything else, it's pretty limited real estate. So I'm gonna see if I can get in here somehow and just kind of mark approximately where this shift rod would go through if it were sticking straight up. And then after that, I'll come back later and pull the floor out and drill a hole. So they will get a little bit of a dot started there. I'm just gonna try to scratch a line more or less right in this vicinity, approximately of what I think the shift rod's width is gonna be. There we go, that should be pretty clear. That looks fairly centered to me. Maybe a little bit towards the front. So maybe I'll extend the scratch back ever so slightly. If I can get in here again, I don't know how I did that before. There we go. That should be a bit more centered. So now I'm gonna pull this floorboard off again. I'll drill that out, make a fairly wide hole. That way I can get my shift assembly installed through there. So as I went to install the linkage permanently and get the this, this shift lever end installed onto the, onto the rod where the splines are, I did realize that by flipping it around now that it's interfering with the edge of the bracket. The bracket lip sticks out a good bit past the actual shift tower there and even past where this gusset is and this machine surface is. So what's happening is when I try to put it in there, it won't close up tight enough and that's why I get this gap. And that's allowing it to have a little bit of wiggle room in there. It's also preventing me from getting the Allen head bolt through the front there, which uh, both acts as a clamp and then the rod itself has a machined lip inside there where that bolt goes through to hold it in place as well. So I just can't get that bolt in there. So I'm thinking that this was probably not designed for an original brake setup like this using the Klings adapter. It was probably meant for juice brakes or something like that where this rod is no longer in this place. And that way everything would probably clear pretty easily. We also probably wouldn't have the issue I had with the whole assembly being lifted up. So we're just having to deal with a couple of small little issues here as they come up. But overall, it really hasn't been anything too major or too severe. Things have been fairly straightforward for the most part. So what I'm going to do is probably pull this back apart, knock that out of there, come in here with like uh, the die grinder or a Dremel or something like that, take the edge of that off see if that'll allow it to come forward enough make sure that it can swing like right now i have it all the way back it does go forward without an issue and with the forward then it does actually kind of tuck up in there so let's make sure that it can swing enough without getting in the way of anything so here from the other side you can see this lip i'm talking about right here that would be grinding off i'll probably just try to come up to about maybe here or so get it flush with this face and try not to do any 
damage to this face at all. I just want to take this lip down so that it is even with this face. That way I can get the swing arm reinstalled up here and tighten it up nice and tight to this edge. So now I'm just about finished buttoning up the top here. Uh, I do have the shifter fully installed. It's moving nice and smoothly now that I ground that little lip off the outside edge. I did go through and uh, get the Allen bolt installed. I also greased the Zerk fitting that's here. That greases the shift rod that's inside of there. I greased my clamshell while I was under here. It does seem like it helped with my interference problem. It does seem to be clearing now. I'm not sure once the engine's running while I'm driving around if that's going to start banging around and causing an issue, but we'll deal with that. If it does come up, I'll just get under there, like I said, and clearance that out a bit. Probably just a hammer and a punch just to bend the front of that lip up should, should be more than enough. One issue I did run into is that these things, as you can see, do collide when I'm in third gear. So I do have the swan shifter. I believe this is the commercial style. That's the straight for these later style shifters. I believe these are the, I think these came out in 36 or 37 and ran through 53 or 52 in the, in the commercial trucks or in the trucks where they still had the top loaders. Uh, the Swan Next, I believe, where it's more curved, came in the cars, I believe. I don't remember the years offhand. They are a bit more desirable, so they're harder to find. But uh, we'll take that out here once I get everything buttoned up and we'll just kind of see if that will work in there, if I'll get enough clearance. Alternatively, I did notice that this shift linkage is just pinned into this uh, base down there through the sides with a, just a roll pin. So you could probably knock that off, or knock that out, I'm sorry, cut the rod down and shorten it up if need be. Although I'm just worried if I did that, that then the shift knob would be down here and it'd be a little awkward shifting it. So if I can avoid that at all possible, I'm gonna try not to go that route. I'm going to try to see if I can just do something with the shifter itself. So here you can see I have one of my Swan Neck shifters installed and it's still the same issue. It, it just comes way too close when you're in, in third gear. I'm not quite sure what you're supposed to do with these given that it puts the, the Mitchell shifter, which is very, very straight, almost directly in line with, with the right hand side of the shift tower. So it seems like no matter what you do, unless you have a really modified stick coming out of your shifter that's always going to hit in third gear. So I may give Mitchell Manufacturing a call and just see what kind of feedback they've had from people who've run these same transmissions with this same bracket and see if there's a, just a different style shift lever that perhaps they have or if they have any recommendations for me. But for now it's not going to be an issue. I'm just going to run it like this where it doesn't have the knob on it since that way I can still get it in gear without it clanking into the knob. That way I can at least put it together, do the test drives, get this video out for you guys, and get some feedback. But uh, for now, we're just gonna put the original straight one back in there because that gave me a bit more clearance than these Swan ones do. I thought for sure these Swan ones would give me more, but apparently not. So we'll get that done. We'll finish buttoning everything up, then we'll, See you bright and early tomorrow for the test drive. So now I have the top mat reinstalled and just about completely buttoned up up here, but I did want to show you how I usually install the boots for these. Snyder sells this little rubber boot that I usually use for the e-brake, which is why it's now missing it. But it just slides over the rod. And what I do is I cut the hole out kind of small, similar to what I have for the e-brake. And then I leave the rubber base below and I pull it up the rest of it through the mat and that way it kind of holds it in place it doesn't walk around when you shift it stays in there the same thing with the shift boot here i have the outer ring under installed underneath so if you are thinking about getting one of these transmissions something to keep in mind is that the shift tower is moved forward i think it's a half an inch to an inch so if you get a pre-cut floor mat from snyder's it will not fit this is one of their non-cut ones, and I just aligned the transmission shift tower with the hole that came with it. I cut it out, and then I lined up all the rest of the holes from there. And it makes it look 
legitimate that way and very hard to tell what you have under there. So here we are, it's the next day. The weather is holding out. We still got a couple of fall colors out here in Michigan, but not for long. It is a little bit chilly. It's just about 40 degrees right now. It is supposed to be the low 60s today, so it should be perfect for this. I'm gonna get the camera mounted up here in the car, and then we're gonna go for a couple of test drives. Okay, we should be all ready to set the go. I do have my phone set up with a GPS speedometer over there, so hopefully you'll be able to see that. It might show up a little bit better on the video than my actual speedometer here, which sometimes isn't the most accurate thing in the world. Please disregard the hole in my roof that someone previous to me had cut out for a sunroof. I do need to come back through here and kind of redo this area and install a new headliner. I did install the new vinyl top to cover that up and I just have a piece of plastic kind of in here where the hole was before, but unfortunately it is what it is. So we're all set to go. Car's warmed up, ready to rock. So let's go see how this does. So one of the first ones I want to try is turning right out of my house here on this highway where traffic does get going a bit quick. I like to wait until all the cars have gone past. As turning right out of here, we're going to hit a hill very shortly. And usually I don't quite have enough oomph going up that hill, so I always feel like, you know, if I just had an extra gear, it would be perfect. So now we do, and we're about to find out.
many miles before the first block has no problem with it but this overdrive unit again there we go it just makes everything much much more comfortable it just kind of puts it down in a nice tolerable zone so i think i'm going to use this quite a bit um, if I, usually i try to travel right around 50 miles per hour somewhere around there so I suspect I'll probably start using this right around that range. I'll be slowed down there going up the hill a little bit and trying to get to about 50 where I usually cruise just to see how it is. And so like right now this level is very, very, very quiet. Everything is very smooth. It doesn't feel like the engine's lugging at this speed. It feels very, very comfortable. I don't know like how much torque we have at this RPM speed, so I don't know like getting this hill up here. So this is nearly to the floor. It is accelerating down the hill a little bit. We're accelerating up the hill. It does seem to be holding speed, but looks like we got a tractor. Obviously a bit too low, it's starting to lock and we're going to be turning right here, so that's fine. We'll get this thing in second gear, which this is the normal second gear for these V8 transmissions. They did have a couple of different gearing options. So we're doing 25, we have a, a speed sign up ahead that also confirms that our GPS is reading pretty close to accurate so we can wind out second gear quite a bit in this thing usually I can get up to like 35 something like that before the RPMs get too bad but I'm going to try the overdrive second gear just to see how it is so now I'm decelerating this is still second gear just the overdrive activated now Oops, have my blinker on and it is much much quieter so this is the gear where I really wasn't sure if I was going to end up using this that much because it puts this version of, um, I did the math on this and it makes second gear something around like 1.18 if I recall, where obviously third gear is 1 to 1. The original second gear is uh, 1.602 I believe for these transmissions. Shifted in on the second overdrive again. And I mean, it's not a huge difference, obviously, but it's enough where I can kind of cruise around town doing these speeds like 30 miles per hour, where it's, it's pretty quiet. I can just sit in second gear right now. Where I'm third gear and I can do it as well, but it feels like it's lugging ever so slightly. So I am kind of liking this overdriven second gear, even though having the V8 transmission in here already gives me a better second gear so I can get a bit more speed out of it than say the normal Model A transmission. I wasn't quite sure how much I would end up using this but now that I'm using it I'm, I'm liking it. I think I'll end up using it quite a bit. That was one of the kind of uncertainties that I had was is this going to be useful to me this kind of split second gear and I definitely think it is. Now I'm not sure how much of a change is going to be between like going from overdrive second to non-overdriven third gear. That difference ends up being only about 16% between those two gears. It's a fairly small change, so there's not going to be a significant RPM drop. So in most cases I'll probably just be able to go straight from overdriven second into overdriven third which would make it around, I think, like a 36% uh, drop, somewhere in that vicinity. But overall, I am pretty impressed so far. I'm liking this a lot. Uh, one of my big questions that I had was, am I going to use this just for my highway speeds, just for uh, cruising at highway speeds and making it smooth it out and quieting it down? Or was this second gear splitting going to be useful to me? And so far, the answer to that is a resounding yes. I'm 
using it quite a bit now, as you can see, and it's it's very nice. Um, on this next little stretch here, I'll just use third gear instead, so that way we can kind of see what the difference would be between this overdriven second gear and what I would normally have by just shifting into third. I do like driving through these old, small little towns like this. There's quite a few of them around here. It's a little late in our fall season, so a lot of the colors have changed, but there's still a few of them out here. Maybe I'll take a drive later and record some of that as well. But uh, most of the good colors, as you can see, are now on the ground. So here's just regular second gear. I'll wind it up to about 30 so you can kind of hear what it sounds like normally. I have a little bit of an exhaust leak, so it's a little louder than it probably should be. But I mean, you can hear the RPMs are kind of turning. It's a bit noisy. Uh, we're going uphill here, so I'm going to wait a second just so you get a good accurate, kind of flat level depiction of when I shift to third. So here's third. I mean, third is third works at 30 as well. It's a little bit lower in the RPM band than that overdriven second is. And I feel like in this situation, where I'm going to be rounding this sharp corner here, it's like I can leave it in third around here, but then I kind of start lugging and we get down to that 20 and it's like, ah, give me more, give me more. It's like I need more torque. I think in that instance right there, that overdriven second would have been a lot better than me being in third. So yeah, I'm definitely, definitely finding uses for this already, just, just from this short little drive where it's like, I'm definitely going to make use of that. So, this stretch here stays about 25 for a little bit, then we end up getting back to highway speeds. So I'm going to drive right here in my overdrive second. This time I'm going to kind of shift through all of the gears using the gear splitter, which is going to take me a bit of getting used to here. Okay, so there's third gear regular, not overdriven. I'll wind this out a bit. Get the speed built up. There's the overdrive. Yeah, I'm loving it. It just it just makes you feel like you're driving like a five speed or something like that where it's a bit more close ratio than it was before. Having kind of that small power band of these stock style engines like this, it just it just gives you a lot better use of it. So I'm definitely liking it. Just at 50 for those. Maybe if I 
also going a little bit faster, so I'm a little higher in the power band. It should be a little bit better on some of these hills, but overall, very, very satisfied. Again, I definitely think this was worth all the efforts. I do think this combination with this overdrive is definitely worth it, especially if you're going to be cruising at these speeds, or if you have a little bit of a hilly environment like I do here. It just gives you so many options to be able to split all those gears and just get the power to the ground. Alright, there goes the focus. Oh, it's even an ST. It's also blue like I am, but apparently they, they weren't interested in their older grandpa here. Reduces those RPMs, it gives you better control over your power. So you can just make better use of the power you're making, especially if you put one together fairly stock like I did. So, absolutely, if you're on the fence about one of these things, get on the wait list, pick one up, and you're gonna be happy. super rich I highly recommend their synchronized transmission then you don't run into some of the modification issues like I have but at least you have a nice happy synchronized transmission like I do where you can shift second to third without having to rev match all those other things and I'm not knocking the old original transmission they're they're great they work fine I can drive them just fine without without grinding gears but sometimes, just with the way traffic is around here, I need to shift fast and in a hurry. Sometimes I don't have the time for double clutching and downshifts. So just having a synchronized transmission made life a lot easier for me. I also want to get my wife driving this, and she's not that great at driving anything with a manual transmission. So having something synchronized is definitely a lot easier for her. Speaking of, we're probably going to wrap up this video by driving over to the coffee shop where she works, getting us some nice hot apple cider on this cold, chilly fall day that's looking like it's going to turn into a beautiful day. So here's an example of where I'm just leaving it in the original mode, and there you can 
saw I shifted into third at around 25. And you can hear it lug just a little bit. I mean, that's kind of that's kind of almost where the original Model A second gear just runs out of steam. It's right there around 25, and you get into third, and it's like locked down. So it's like once you're up to about 30, it, it's fine. It's just that 25 range. So what I'm going to do here is on this next stop sign, I'm going to use the overdrive second gear again. You're just gonna be able to kind of see that difference where it just makes it so much more useful even again like i said having that v8 second gear here watch out little squirrel he got a gigantic acorn in his mouth or a walnut or something he's getting ready for the winter so anyway sorry about that it's like watching up here with the dogs I saw the squirrel and just completely distracted squirrels are everywhere right now Focus, 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 okay. So second gear here. We're gonna get to about maybe 25-ish, somewhere like that. Uh, maybe even just here at like 22, we're gonna hit the overdrive. And you can see it's just, it's nice and happy. It's not lugging at this point. It sounds nice and happy, it's nice and smooth. You got good power if you need to accelerate or something like that. You can just sit here and kind of cruise at this 25. Whereas before, my RPMs would be starting to get a little louder. It was still doable, but this way works out real nice. This might be my new kind of cruising in town and set up here, second overdrive. So here's my town itself, Ionia, Michigan, a little prison town, our nice scenic little brick road here. So that was me trying to accelerate in the overture of it first gear, which it does do it. I had to slip the clutch just a little bit. Not sure that I'm the biggest fan of that, so I'll probably just leave it like original. transmission. I did just use it there to get into first gear while I was rolling. Uh, you can shift the overdrive into neutral and then you can kind of use that as a synchronizer for your first gear. Mitchell does mention that as something you can do to make getting it into first gear easier while you're still rolling. And hey it does work. That was the first time I tried it. And it was pretty easy, pretty painless. Normally on 
this thing, for some reason, I can just never seem to rev match first gear. I used to be able to do it on the original Model A transmission, but on this one, I've just had no luck. So that might be a benefit as well. Usually I always come to a complete stop before I ever use first gear, but here we are at the coffee shop. It is looking very, very, very busy. But we'll get jammed in here in front of, whoop, here's a spot. <laughs> Almost missed it. So there you have it. Um, first drive, immediately impressed. Absolutely believe these things are worth it. Hopefully my speedometer was visible there for you while I was driving around so you kind of correlate the sounds, the vibrations to the speeds. Again, I do have a little bit of an exhaust leak so the noise in here is a little bit louder than what I probably normally have. The flange on my muffler is pretty beat up. It just doesn't seal very good. I do have a new one on order. So that's probably going to do it for this section of the video. Um, I'm probably going to run inside, get some coffee, drive back home. But uh, I feel like I've said everything I need to say at this point. I think like just this drive pretty much says it all for itself. Again, very satisfied with this Mitchell overdrive. It, it works phenomenally well. This is the 26% overdrive on here right now. Um, I was on the fence between this and the, uh, I think it's the 34%. I forget the other option, but they do offer one that's a little bit higher up. I was strongly considering that, that just based on the speeds that I normally drive, this engine and everything else, the Burt's engine, stuff like that. But you know, it's still just a stock engine in a sense. It runs smoother, but it's making the same power. So that's why I stuck with Excuse me, the 26%. I just felt like I wasn't going to have the torque to be able to really spin cutting it down that higher percentage. And I'm glad I went that route because, as you can see, some of those hills I do struggle to kind of maintain the speeds if I'm going a little bit slower. So I feel like this was the perfect setup. So, very, very happy with this combination right now this V8 transmission in here, synchronizers, that second gear that's already reduced just from being in this V8 transmission, makes second gear absolutely perfect right now. The overdriven second gear is amazing. The quietness at cruising speeds, so yeah, just completely sold. Absolutely happy. So, if you're on the fence, like I said, hopefully this video helps you. If you've got a transmission similar to this already installed, and you're thinking about getting a Mitchell and you just weren't sure, hopefully this kind of gives you some of that information that you need but otherwise if you have a regular model a highly recommend it if you have one of these transmissions it cleans it after all that stuff still highly recommend it So that's gonna wrap it up for this video. I did make it home again. I'm gonna go out and enjoy the rest of this beautiful day out here in Michigan. Try to enjoy some of these last colors while I can before they're gone. Winter will be here soon. So final conclusion is the Mitchell Overdrive is absolutely worth it. Whether we have a stock Model A 
whether you have the Burt's block, whether you have the V8 transmission in there, definitely worth it. So again, just a big thank you to the Mitchell family for producing these things, getting this thing out to me. It was a long wait to get it. Um, I think it took me about nine months, somewhere around there for me to finally get my unit. But I tell you what, it was absolutely worth the wait. I am very, very, very pleased. So that's gonna do it for this video. I should have a couple more coming out in the near future. I do have the Burt's high compression head on the way that they have just finally started shipping out the people. It will fit a little bit better on here than my Snyder's head does currently. It'll bump the compression up by about a half a point, so it's not gonna be a huge difference in terms of performance, but we'll end it there and we'll see you again in the future.